Merry meet and welcome to Thrilling Thursday here at Ariel's Corner. This is Ariel Gatoga and we are streaming live on YouTube and on Twitch. This is lesson 14 of A Witch's Primer Revisited. And we, uh, let's see, moderating today on YouTube are the lovely Jennifer and the lovely Vanessa. And moderating on Twitch is the lovely Honeypaw. And, oh, I left my my uh, notes. Hold on just a second. I'm so sorry. I'll be right back. This, uh, I didn't want to miss anything because I don't want to just wing this one today because we're going to talk about uh, casting circles. So it's good to have notes in case I get lost, <laughs> especially since I'm sort of still on vacation in my mind. Uh, let's see. So did I tell you? Yes. Moderating today on YouTube are the lovely Jennifer and the lovely Vanessa. Moderating on Twitch is the lovely Honeypaw. Thank you so much, moderators. And thank you to everybody for joining us today. I hope you're enjoying this course. We're coming down to the wire here. This is lesson 14. So uh, there's only 18 lessons total. So we're, we're getting close to being finished with this. And uh, if you are on our Facebook group or our Discord server, you have access to a wonderful community where you can ask questions if you, you know, get lost or you don't remember something or I didn't cover something. You can ask them right in those those two uh, groups, and I'm on those groups as well. So if I'm around and I see your question, I can also chime in. So. If you're not on uh, either of those or both of those, you can go to our website, arielscorner.com, arielscorner.com, and just check out the footer on any page, and you'll see uh, links to our social media, including Discord and our Facebook group, and all kinds of other little links there. So, <laughs> so that's a good place. That's a good resource. Uh, and we have chat threads open on each of these streams today. So if you have questions for me today, personally, you can put them right in the chat thread and I will do my best to answer them. Uh, we don't have a, uh, I, I didn't get a, any, um, premiere done today. So I'm sorry that I don't have the, which is premier premiere, like I try to normally do on Thursdays. I just, um, I was on vacation, so I just didn't do that. I guess I could have, but I didn't. I just took the time off, which I thought was probably smarter. All right, let's get going here. If you are in a place where it is safe and appropriate, please close your eyes and begin to take some nice, long, slow, deep, relaxing breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. With every inhale, feel more light and peace entering the body and mind. With every exhale, feel like you're letting go of all tension in anything you do not want. Picturing ourselves now on top of a beautiful mountain in the center of a circular grove of trees. In the center of our circle, a magical bonfire blazes forth, lighting us and the grove with a sacred golden light. We recognize that this is the light of perfect love and perfect trust, and it burns away everything unlike itself, leaving us safe and serene. Into this magic circle, we invoke the presence of our Creator. To many of us, our Creator reveals themselves as a mother and father, a goddess and God. We also call upon our guides, our angels, our teachers. We ask that we be guided as we walk along the way, becoming happier, more peaceful, more magical, and more loving people. Blessed be. Today is Lesson 14 of A Witch's Primer. Today is Lesson 14 of A Witch's Primer, and we are going to be getting into how to cast a magic circle. And I had written a book that went along with this class, and a lot of what I wrote in that book I've changed my mind on over the years. Um, so I tend to, on my podcasts and things like that share with you what I do currently. <laughs> and one of the other reasons why I like uh, having these podcasts is because I can update them. But uh, the text of how to cast a circle is in the handout of A Witch's Primer. So if you've 
uh, if you don't have access to that handout, it's probably just because you forgot to register for the course. It's free. There's nothing to pay. So if you just register for the course at arielgatoga.com slash AWP, arielgatoga.com slash AWP, you'll be given a link to your lesson page, which has all the links to the different lectures, plus your handouts, plus other interesting information. So within the, those handouts, you're going to find an outline of the circle as I give it. Casting a circle is a fundamental practice in magic and especially in the craft. It's really about creating a sanctified space for our magic without needing to have a permanent sort of temple or church or something. Any place can be purified and transformed into a holy magical space that's appropriate for magical work. So casting a circle involves cleansing an area, marking a boundary and sealing it, calling upon usually elemental forces at each direction, raising energy, and uh, sometimes even invoking deities. And when you're inside that magical sealed space, not only is it easier for you to feel safe and sanctified and pure, but it also gives your mind a a way to focus when you're raising energy. Your, your energy is contained within that circle, and so that it tends to to create more of a focus for the energy that you raise. You don't need to cast a circle for all of your daily magical practices, unless you want to. Of course, you may. Sometimes the idea of casting a circle can feel very tedious and make you not want to bother. So it's better, if that's the case, to just do the magic and save your circle casting for times when you need that special sacred space, especially that can be helpful when you're working with a group of people. But it can have its benefits when you're working solo as well. Casting a circle might at first seem to be a little confusing and a little intimidating, but just be patient and practice it for a while and you'll get the hang of it. A good tip for beginners is to practice casting a circle once a day until it becomes smooth and natural. For the first week or two, consider practicing it in sections before putting it all together. After a couple of weeks, try to memorize the entire process and practice it for another week. And then once you're kind of like not tethered to the outline, uh, you can feel free to add your own touches to the ritual and make it your own. So let's talk first about proper circle etiquette if you are in a group setting before we start talking about how to actually cast the circle. If you are in a group, or especially if you are a guest in a group, it's expected that everyone will be quiet and reflective before the circle is cast. This usually means avoiding jokes and arguments, noisy conversations, etc. Often a period of silence is observed prior to the ritual being performed. During this, if you need to communicate, just do so quietly or step outside the area. Once the circle has been cast, it's usually not okay to cross the boundary of the circle without asking somebody that's in charge to help you. Uh, breaching that circle boundary is, is really not a good idea. Obviously, if there's an emergency or something like that, you can do it. But it's also usually considered impolite to talk during the circle casting or during the ritual unless there's some sort of informal period, which is frequently uh, during the cakes and wine or libations. People are usually also sensitive about their tools. So if there's an altar set up, you don't want to just go handle the tools on the altar unless you're directed to do so, or at least ask permission before you pick up somebody's tools. It's rather disrespectful, and sometimes people get their, get their dander up if you do that.
typically ritual movements in a circle are performed sunwise. In the northern hemisphere, sunwise is cl- is clockwise. In the southern hem- hemisphere, in the sun, in the southern hemisphere, it's counterclockwise. The direction is known as diocil in witchcraft, although technically it's pronounced josil or jisil or jossil. I think it's jossil in Gaelic. I think it's jossil. I, I, it's been a while since I've been speaking Gaelic. I was never very good at it. I'm pretty sure it's jossil. It's pronounced jossil in Gaelic. However, most English speakers use the spelling and sound it out phonetically, and we say diocil because the correct pronunciation might not be widely recognized. Widdershins is commonly the word used in the craft to denote anti-sunwise. So in the northern hemisphere, this would be counterclockwise, and in the southern hemisphere, this would be clockwise. The person leading the ritual will typically inform you if the direction you walk in or move in in the circle matters to them. In some cases, they may not be concerned at all about it. And sometimes people are very particular that you only move one direction or the other while in the circle. So if you're asked to move only clockwise, just follow the directions. If a sacred fire is involved, in a ritual, it's really important not to dispose of things in the sacred fire, like cigarette butts or trash or anything, actually. Putting anything into a sacred fire without asking for permission is really not a good idea. Typically, those sacred fires are are consecrated, and very often they're consecrated for specific purposes, and you putting stuff in and feeding the fire on your own without asking permission uh, can disrupt the energy of them. Now, there are many techniques for casting circles, and I'm going to share a ritual with you that's very detailed and very comprehensive. It's the whole package. However, you can also cast very simple circles on your own. You don't have to do this whole thing. For example, the orb of light exercise that we work with is a type of basic circle casting unto itself. To cast a circle very simply, you can just take your athame or your wand or just your your index finger or index and middle finger and trace a circle around your working area, imagining a bluish-white light emanating from the tip of the athame, wand, or fingers and marking the ground around you. That's how simple a casting of a circle can be. You can also, uh, if, if you have both of those tools, the wand and the blade, try one and then try the other and notice the difference, if any, that you experience when you're practicing your, your circle casting. We typically cast our circles sunwise, so that's deosil or jossil, deosil, and sometimes we'll cast them counter, uh, uh, anti-sunwise or widdershins, depending on the tradition or depending on what we're doing. For instance, sometimes for working magic during the waxing moon, people will prefer to cast their circles sunwise, and during the waning moon, they will prefer to cast their circles anti-sunwise. Sometimes people will always cast their circle sunwise, and they will never cast their circle uh, anti-sunwise, or vice versa. For our purposes here, casting everything DSL is probably a smart and safe idea. Remember, DSL means sunwise, and Widdershin means anti-sunwise. In the northern hemisphere, DSL is clockwise, and Uh, Widdershins is counterclockwise. In the Southern Hemisphere, you switch those. Now, the basic steps for casting your circle are laid out in a specific sequence to maximize the desired effect. So I'm going to detail each step consecutively with you now. First, begin with a grounding and centering. Sorry, sorry. first you're going to start with a grounding and centering, followed by a cleansing and purifying of the area, then an energy boundary, 
and then calling on the watchtowers. Then you'll raise energy, typically in the form of a cone of power. Optionally, you may want to invoke a deity if your practice involves working with deities. And then you will do your intended magical work. In group settings, this is often where libations are common after this work. And if then deities have been invoked, you thank them, and then you back out of the of the circle. You take everything down in the reverse order that you put it up. So you thank the deities, you lower the cone of power, you say goodbye and close the watchtowers at each direction, you banish the circle boundary, and then perform a final grounding and centering. So first, with the grounding and centering, remember that the goal is twofold. Grounding helps you to relax and release tension and connect with a power source such as the earth to preserve your own energy. Centering balances the energy flowing within your body once you've grounded it. It's crucial that you ground and center before doing your magical work. You can use the meditation that I've shared with you in, uh, I think it was lesson one or two. I think it was maybe lesson two. And, or any other method that you find that works for you. Before starting, you should probably take some sort of ritual bath. That's very common. And obviously, if you don't have a bath, you can do a ritual shower. It's a good idea to include some salt and maybe even some essential oil or tea of hyssop or lavender, but those are optional. During the bath, it's a good idea to reflect on your day and let it go so that you're not carrying any stress of your day into your ritual with you. Once you have finished your bath, then you can either show up at the group that you're going to have the ritual with, or you can show up to your own area where you're going to cast your own circle. <clears throat> Obviously, like I said, you want to make sure that you've resolved any, if you're with a group, you want to make sure that you've resolved any interpersonal conflicts or problems with other people prior to showing up for the ritual. Bringing any personal tensions into a circle is bad enough, but bringing tensions regarding other people present in the circle is not good for you or anybody else present. The basic principle is that if you can't gather in perfect love and perfect trust, it's best to just stay home. This doesn't mean that you have to be best friends with everybody at the ritual, but you should be able to relax and respect everyone involved. Many traditions include a ritual ceremony to unify the group. Uh, often this is a meeting dance. Uh, usually this opening involves some sort of anointing with oil. And if you're not in a group, you can still anoint yourself with oil. When using an essential oil, make sure that it's diluted heavily with a carrier oil to avoid skin irritation. Any vegetable oil will do. It does not need to be scented. <clears throat> uh, you, can send, you can just anoint your third eye point or you can anoint all your chakra points if you prefer. Before you enter a circle, especially a group circle, there's often an aura cleansing. Now, if, you've, if you're doing this on your own and you've taken your ritual bath, you can omit this step. But in a group setting, very frequently they will, uh, after the meeting and anointing, excuse me, uh, cleanse each other with a smudge smudge stick or some incense and perhaps sprinkling of some salt water as they enter the circle space, the ritual space. But like I said, if you've taken your ritual bath and you're just doing this on your own, you don't need to cleanse your aura again. You've already done that. Typically, the group's leaders or their, um, whoever happens to be in charge of that circle or the priest and priestess of that coven will handle this purification and anointing. Next, the space that we are working in will need to be purified, especially since it's usually not used only for ritual. Uh, it'll have had some sort of everyday activity there. So we want to clean out the space of any energies so that we can tune it to our purpose. This is usually done with salt and water and with incense. So each of those things are charged with our electric blue witch light, like we've used in the consecration of your tools. Now, frequently what we do is we take each element and consecrate it separately. 
So you would put some salt on your pinnacle and consecrate it. You would put some um, water in your chalice and put it on your pinnacle and consecrate it. You would take some incense after, then you would add add the salt to. Oh, sorry. Then you would add the salt to the water. Actually, I said that in reverse. You would take some water in your chalice and set it on your pentacle, and you would bless the water. Then you would take some. Did I say water? You take some water in your chalice, put it on your pentacle, and bless it. Then you would take some salt and put it directly on your pentacle and bless it. Then you'd mix the salt into the water and set it aside. Then you take some incense and place it on the pentacle and bless it. Nope, I said that backwards again. You take your thurible with hot coals and put it on the pentacle and bless it. And then you would take your incense material and put it on the pentacle and bless it. Then you would put the incense material on top of the hot coals. So you could streamline that if you didn't want to bless each thing separately. You could put the salt and water together and then bless them together. Or, and then you could put the incense on the hot coals and bless, bless the incense. Either way. But you're going to take it one at a time. Usually, we'll do the salt and water first. You will start your purification uh, at the center of your circle and walk, usually clockwise, in a spiral around and around the circle, getting larger and larger until you get to where the perimeter of the circle is going to be. And you'll sprinkle salt water the whole time, usually chanting some purification chant such as salt and water where you are cast, no spell nor unknown purpose last, something like that. And I've given you these chants in your handouts already. Then you would do the same thing with your incense. Starting in the center of the circle, you'd walk around in a clockwise fashion, spiraling outward until you get to the perimeter of your circle, cleansing with incense. Now, if you are by yourself and you don't like using incense, you could use a a spray perfume or cologne if you prefer, or you could use, an. um, sometimes I'll use a little um, thurible that's actually an oil burner. So there's a little water in the oil burner and you can put some essential oil in there and then you can use the essential oil vapor instead of incense. Anyway, once this energy, uh, once the area is purified, once the area is purified, we need to keep it that way, and we do that by sealing it off with an energy boundary. This boundary acts as a shield against unwanted energies and vibrations, ensuring that the power also remains contained within. It, ster- it serves this dual purpose: protection and containment. The common tool for Casting the circle is the athame, but a wand can also be effective, as I've already said. It's important to experiment with both and see which one suits you better in different circumstances, and only you can determine that through experience. Like I said, you could also just use your fingers, either an index finger or the index and middle finger extended together are common. Uh, use the the dominant your dominant hand. If you're truly ambidextrous, then use the the hand that you take nourishment with, the one that you tend to eat with. That's the one that you'll use. If that's really truly ambidextrous and you do one or the other, then it doesn't matter which hand you use. Now, different traditions may have specific guidelines as to the diameter of the circle you're going to cast while others are more flexible, allowing the circle to just fit the space or the number of participants involved. Uh, It depends. Usually, I don't care about the particular measurements, but if I'm doing a specific kind of ritual with a specific kind of numerological um, power that I want to incorporate into it, I will... um, make a knot at with my cord at half of the, uh, I, I will measure half the feet that I want my circle to be. And then I will put the, uh, anchor the, the cord at the center of where I'm going to have my circle. And I'll use the cord to measure the circle. But it's very rare that I do that. I usually just do it. I usually just wing it and it can be whatever size I want it to be. <clears throat> When you're casting your circle, like I said, it should be that electric blue witch light that we've been working with all this time. You see it either going through your fingers, through your wand, or through your athame as you're walking the perimeter. Uh, After you're casting 
your circle is fit after casting your circle is finished you want to avoid crossing its boundary to maintain its integrity repeatedly crossing it will weaken its its power so you don't want to do that marking the circle's boundary on the ground can be very helpful especially at first for indoor practices you can use chalk masking tape or salt uh, or any other thing that, that would suit you. While in an outdoor set, setting, uh, you could use sand, dirt, or pine cones, that kind of thing, to mark the boundary. Now, bark, m marking the boundary is not necessary, but it can definitely enhance your experience. To cast the circle, stand at the intended perimeter facing outwards, ready to begin. Start by pointing your blade, wand, or finger downward at the ground, where you tend to establish that energy boundary. Typically, you will begin in either the east or the north, depending on your tradition or depending on the type of ritual that you're working. You can start it in one of the other directions as well. So you're going to connect to the power that you grounded with during your grounding and centering, and allow that energy to surge up through your body and out through your arm via the tip of your athame wand or fingertips. As you see this energy di shooting directly down onto the ground, walk in the direction that you're going to walk, usually deosil, around the entire perimeter of the circle. While doing so, you will chant a conjuration uh, that's given in the, the handout or one of your own making. I conjure thee, O circle of power, that thou beest a boundary between the worlds of humans and the realms of the mighty ones, a guardian and protection that shall preserve and contain that great power I shall raise within you. Wherefore do I bless and consecrate thee? Something like that. <clears throat> anyway, so you keep walking the perimeter, conjuring that circle, seeing that blue light forming, seeing that circle forming all around you, and then you'll finish by slightly overlapping where you started so that there's no gaps in your circle. After sealing the sacred space, everybody, if there's a group, will take a moment to visualize in their minds this circle before moving forward. Now, as I mentioned just a second ago, you can overlap the area where you began your casting. For example, if you start in the east, consider beginning in the northeast instead, and then ending in the east. When moving clockwise, especially in the northern hemisphere, you'll end up slightly overlapping. Oh, I'm sorry, I already said that. Another useful technique involves drawing a figure eight on its side, also known as a knot of infinity, symbolizing the connection of the starting and the ending strands of your circle. So that's another idea that some people will use. When they finish their circle casting, they'll draw that little knot of infinity to uh, symbolize that they have that they've connected the circle so that there's no gaps. I just usually tend to overlap it. Next, we call upon the watchtowers. And the watchtowers are simply the elements at each of the four corners of the circle. Now, sometimes in some, in some traditions, you're going to call upon specific deities, specific beings, specific angels. We keep everything generic in a witch's primer. So these are just the, the elemental guardians that are always there at each direction. Now, in the system that I'm teaching you here, those four cardinal directions relate to the four elements as follows. In the east, this, now first of all, in the northern hemisphere, east is associated with air, south with fire, west with water, and north with earth. In the hemisphere of the south, the southern hemisphere, in the southern hemisphere, you will swap the associations between south and north. So in the in the southern hemisphere, your uh, south is earth and your north is fire. To call upon the guardians, just open we open portals into the realms of each element. Now remember, to evoke means to summon an entity into a specific space temporarily, while invoke means to call an entity into oneself for an indefinite period as a form of worship. We evoke entities considered uh, 
equal to us or lower, quote, lower than us on the evolutionary scale, although I don't like to think of anyone as lower than me. But we invoke those beings that we feel are higher than us, such as angels and deities. Now, some people don't ascribe to any of that, and and you don't have to worry about that, about invoking if you don't believe in higher powers. But for this, uh, do evoke. You want to evoke at each quarter because you want each of those quarters to stay put at the four directions. You don't want just them coming into you. You want it to be so that each of those four quarters has a guardian. <clears throat> so each element is associated with a color, and in this system, we uh, are air is yellow, fire is red, water is blue, and earth is green. You might find many, many different opinions and systems. And if you choose a different system, that's absolutely fine. But in the system I'm teaching you, east, uh, excuse me, I'm not going to say the directions because it might be different depending on southern or northern hemisphere. Air is yellow, fire is red, water is blue, and earth is green. Now, it's common to practice It's a common practice, excuse me, it's a common practice to place a candle in the color of the corresponding element at the perimeter of the circle in each of the four directions. And if you choose to do this, just set up those candles ahead of time. In the northern hemisphere, obviously the directional colors for the candles are yellow in the east, red in the south, west in the, uh, west or blue in the, sorry, west is blue. Let's type that again. In the Northern Hemisphere, the directional colors for the candle would be East is yellow, South is red, West is blue, North is green. In the Southern Hemisphere, simply swap the colors for North and South. So East is yellow, South is green, West is blue, and North is red. Lighting these candles during the evocation of each quarter signifies the presence of the watchtower of that quarter and helps to helps you to visualize the color associated with each direction. The act of confining space during these rituals is not about trapping an entity or intimidating an entity. It's more akin to preparing a welcoming environment, similar to tidying your home before hosting a party. It's a gesture of respect to each of these elements. Evocations typically start in the east or the north, depending on where you happen to begin casting your circle. If you start in the east, begin your watchtowers in the east. If you started your circle in the north, begin your watchtowers in the north. Remember that the north and the south are always reversed in the southern hemisphere based on what I'm talking about here. Instead of the athame, which seems like a threatening instrument, I tend to personally use my wand when I'm calling on the quarters, but it's very traditional to use your athame for the quarters, and you can do that as well. During the ritual, you will hold your tool or just your hands aloft and you recite whatever invocation or evocation, excuse me, recite whatever evocation you desire. I've given you an example in the handout and then you will draw the invoking pentagram in the air with your tool, imbuing it with the color associated with that direction before lighting the candle of that quarter, if you've put a candle down in that quarter. This process is repeated for each direction moving sunwise. After calling all four quarters, pause for a moment for a silent salute, visualizing the pentagrams shining in each of their respective colors. So in the Northern Hemisphere, for instance, you would then see a shining yellow pentagram in the east, a red pentagram in the south, a blue pentagram in the west, and a green pentagram in the north. Drawing the pentagram is something that we do, but it's not necessary. You can simply call upon the quarters without any visual representation of them. If you prefer, you don't even need, you don't need a candle and you don't need a pentagram if you don't want one. It's effective to just do a calling of the quarters, envisioning a portal opening at each direction to each of the elemental kingdoms. In, now, if you want to use the pentagrams, I've in your in the handout, I've given you 
the diagram of how you can do the invoking pentagram, or you can call it the evoking pentagram, or the banishing pentagram, which is going to come when we close the portals. Now, in that handout, you also have an option to circle the pentagram. You, could, you have the option to circle the pentagram in the air after you've drawn it in the air. And that's another option you have. If you're going to circle it, you want to circle it clockwise for the evoking pentagram and counterclockwise for the banishing pentagram. <clears throat> Again, drawing a pentagram is traditional but not mandatory. You can simply call the quarters. Now, once you have finished calling the quarters, then it's time to raise power. Now, you've already raised power in the last, in the last lesson. You've learned how to raise power. Now, we're going to raise power and allow it to form a cone of power that's anchored at the perimeter of the circle with its tip usually at the full moon, at a star, at the sun, or some sort of apex that we imagine above our heads. Now, if you're in a group setting, you'll have everybody join hands and breathe and pull energy up and then start passing energy to the person if you're on, in the um, northern hemisphere to the person on their left and pulling in energy from the person on their right, sharing that energy as it goes around and around the circle. And then somebody's usually directing this, this exercise so that you're all seeing the cone of power being raised and an apex forming at whatever the goal happens to be. But if you're on your own, you can simply raise power as we showed you how to do last lesson and see it forming that cone of power all around you and see that energy boundary that's around you being where the base of the cone is anchored. I prefer using, um, when I'm imagining an apex, I like to, no matter where the moon happens to be, I happen to like to see the moon directly above me and, and uh, let the point of the cone or the apex of the cone rest on the moon. But sometimes if I'm doing a solar ritual, I'll have the, the sun be above me. Or if I'm doing a ritual to a particular planet, I'll imagine that that planet is directly above me. There's a lot of ways to raise energy and raise a cone of power. And with practice, you'll get better at doing it. Just do your best and you'll do just fine. Now, when you're calling upon a deity, this would be the time to do it after the cone is raised. Now, some people don't do deities or they don't call upon anything like that. They're completely non-religious and they like to just do their magic and they don't like any kind of religion associated with their magic. And that's fine. You don't need that. But if you do like to call in a deity, like maybe you're working with um, a god and a goddess, or maybe you're working with the personification of one of the planets, or maybe you're working with a, an archangel, this might be when you would call them in. <clears throat> After you've called your deity, it's time to do your work. And that's usually your spell that you're going to cast. If you're, in a, if you're in a ritual with other people, you'll probably do some sort of group magic or a group spell that you're working. Uh, any kind of spell that you want to do inside a circle, now would be the kind of time to do it. It might be as simple as just doing a mental spell where you're visualizing a particular outcome. Or it might be, a, you might be where you do your poppet. If you're doing a poppet or a chord spell, you might be start to, to tie your knots at this point. Whatever you're doing for your spell, if you're doing it in a circle, it's at this point. After the energy's been raised and after if you've chosen to call upon some sort of deity or entity, this would be when it would be. Once you've finished with your work, that's when you tend to do libations. And so if you've decided to do libations, make sure that you have a second chalice than what you've used for your salt and water or use something else for your salt and water besides your chalice because you don't want salty wine or salty juice. So, so usually this is where you would have your cakes and wine if you're in a, a group setting or also solo. And remember to leave some wine on the altar and a cake on the altar for uh, your deities if you've called them. And, uh, and this is where you just relax and just 
kick back and sort of feel the energy. It's more relaxed in a group setting as well, where you can uh, have some conversation. Usually it's conversation that's about the ritual, not something super mundane. But once you've finished with that libation time, it's time to take everything down. So you just do everything back in reverse from the way that you put it up. So you're going to start with thanking and saying farewell to any deities or angels that you've invoked, if any. Then you will take down the cone and you just simply see it melting like candle wax down and you feel like you're grounding and centering and earthing that cone of power into the earth. You'll do that either by yourself or with a group. Then you'll go around to each quarter and you'll thank each quarter and you'll close the quarter. If you've used a pentagram, you'll use a banishing pentagram to close the quarter. If you've circled the pentagram, you will, uh, you will uncircle it counterclockwise. Then you'll pick up the energy boundary. You'll go backwards. I usually go the opposite way that I've cast the circle. So if I've cast the circle clockwise, I'll go counterclockwise to uncast the circle. But you can do it both clockwise if you prefer. I just walk the perimeter of the circle. And with usually the same tool that I've cast it, I see it erasing. I see that that, that circle boundary is becoming dispersed. And uh, then I'll do a final grounding and centering. Then we'll do some sort of final grounding and centering, either alone or with your group. And then usually some sort of uh, affirmation that the circle is open. So with a group, it's usually something like, may the circle be open yet unbroken. May the love of the God and goddess be ever in our hearts. Merry meet, and merry part, and merry meet again. Or if you're just by yourself, you might just want to clap your hands together, or stomp your feet, make it really clear the ritual is over. And then just clean everything up and you're done. And that's how you cast a circle. And this is, like I said, something that, that you don't have to do the full ritual like I've given it to you. But if you want to do the full ritual like I've given it to you and you want to get good at it, you might want to try doing it once a day or once a week and just get to where you can do this very quickly. I used to just, when I was learning how to cast a circle, I would cast the whole circle. I'd meditate for a few minutes. And then instead of doing work, I wouldn't necessarily do work each time because the work was me practicing the casting of the circle. And then I'd take it down. And I got to the point where I could cast a circle in like 10, 15 minutes max. And uh, you can do that as well. And you can memorize the process and add your own flourishes to it and make it your own. And like I said, you don't have to do all of this. You can simply uh, do the boundary. You can simply call upon the quarters. Try it different ways for yourself and see uh, how it works. This is your craft, and this will be your circle as well. So you can do it as you decide to. But check out the different handouts that, that come with this course, and you'll see that within the main handout that I have given you an outline for this circle that I've just described for you so that you can not get lost and follow along with it. All right. Thank you so much for joining me today. Until next time, blessed be. I knew that was going to be a long one. Let's see if anybody had any questions. I'm not seeing any, but sometimes I don't see them and then they pop up. So I'm going to give it a second. Uh, so far, no questions have popped up on my iPad, so I'm going to assume we don't have any. All right. Thank you so much for spending some time with me. We are winding down on A Witch's Primer Revisited, but we have four more lessons, so I hope that you can join me for those every Thursday. Thank you so much to the amazing moderators, Jennifer, Vanessa, and Diane, and we will see you all very soon. Much, much love and many, many blessings. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes,